Hi, welcome back. We're in lecture 15, segment two, and what we'll do in this segment is we'll write in our script to do both dependent and independent t-tests. So there it is, that's the goal. Write a script in R, do dependent and independent t. Uh, as I mentioned in the last segment, we'll use the working memory training example, and we'll do just pre versus post to do dependent t, and we'll do control versus training to do independent t. Uh, these data are available on the course website. So uh, the file name is stats1.ex.07.txt. Uh, so again, you can play along here, download the data, and just play along and write the script. Um, so I did the usual thing at the top here. I'm actually skipping some of the stuff. You've, you've done enough scripts uh, that I'm not writing out everything. Um, so I'm just cutting to the chase here. Uh, we read the data in and we print descriptives as a typical first step, right? Um, so I read the data into a data frame called WM, and then I used the describe by function to get descriptive statistics for all the variables by condition. And here's just the first part of that output. Um, I actually chopped it up into a couple slides because there's a lot, uh, because there are several conditions. There's the control group, and again, these aren't the actual Yaki data. I just made up data that sort of looked like it, uh, or looked like their results. And I put 40 subjects in the control condition. You can see that here. Um, and here are some descriptive statistics. Uh, you're used to looking at this by now. But remember, the number of sessions was also a between groups uh, manipulation. So the describe by function will list out descriptives for the control group, now descriptives for what I call the T08 group, that's the eight sessions, T12, that's 12 sessions, 17, 19. Seven. And what you can see is, most important thing to look at is look at the gain score, I sort of wrote over it there, the gain score uh, is 1.35 if you had eight sessions, and then it's 2.6 if you had 12, and then it's 4.4 .4 if you had 17, and it's 5.6 if you had 19. So again, mimicking that graph that we just looked at um, in the last segment, uh, it looks like the gain scores go up as you have more sessions of training. So one thing I'm gonna do at the outset of this script is create some subsets of data. Uh, because remember, we're approaching the data in a couple different ways to do different kinds of analyses. So just to make our lives easier, I'm going to subset the data. One way I'm going to subset it is by control and training conditions. Um, because remember, in the next segment, we're going to do a one-way ANOVA where we just want to look within the subjects who had training. So we don't really need the people who are in the control group. Uh, so I'll just have two subsets. WM.C are people who didn't do any training. So in the data frame, that's a variable named train. And if train is zero, that means they didn't do any training. If train is one, that means they were in one of those four training conditions. I have a little extra code here that you haven't seen before. And I'm doing that because we need to access some of the variables in the descriptive statistics output in order to calculate effect size. So R doesn't have a built-in function to do eta squared. I mean, we, we can write one, and in fact, my graduate student Michael Chow has, and I'll show you that uh, in the ANOVA um, segment. Um, it's one of the beautiful things about R. If it doesn't have the function, well, write the function and save it, and then you, you have it for the rest of your life. Um, so I'll show you how we're gonna do that. Um, what we're going to do is use the describe function to get the descriptives and then assign it to a new object like wm.c.out and then we can access the uh, statistics in that, uh, in that object. Uh, and I'll show you how we do that in a moment. So here's the code for the dependent t-tests. Uh, the function is just t.test and if it's a dependent t-test, then we want to set this argument paired equal to true. And 
All we have to do is just list the two variables we want to compare separated by a comma. So first I'm going to look in the control condition, I'm going to look at the prepost. So that's wm.c dollar sign to access the variable name pre versus post. And then I do the same thing for the training condition. Remember, whenever we do this sort of null hypothesis significance test, we should just always have an estimate of effect size right there with it. So I did that here. Here's the Cohen's D. What's Cohen's D for a dependent p-test? This is in a live class. I would pause and wait for somebody to give me the answer. Um, so what's Cohen's D for the dependent t-test? Well, it's just the mean difference over the standard error of the difference. And there's some funky looking code here, but remember wmc.out from the previous slide, that contains the descriptive statistics for that control condition. So we can sort of go into that table, again, think back to your matrix algebra lecture, that's the fourth row, third column, we can pick that out, and that is the mean on the gain score for the control condition. And then I divide that by the standard deviation, which is in the fourth row, fourth column of that output, which you'll see in a moment. Same thing for the training. So here's the output. Uh, so I, I ran that script. And here's the first t-test for the control condition. And what we see is, again, the scientific notation here. It's a really low p-value. It's a high t-value. Uh, so the mean difference is almost 2. Why is it negative? Well, that's really arbitrary. It's because I put pre first and then post. If I flip them around, then it would be positive 9. doesn't really matter. Uh, the p-value would still be the same. Notice the degrees of freedom is 39 because there were 40 subjects in the control condition. What this is showing us, beyond just the, the R script and the code and the numbers, what does this mean? Well, this means that people in the control group exhibited a practice effect just on the test. They did better on the post-test probably because they had exposure to the test before when they took the pre-test. That's why you have, it's necessary to have the control group in there because people just demonstrate practice effects on tests. And they're showing a pretty big practice effect in this example. This is a little larger than what Yaki et al. observed. Um, and I just made up the data. Here's the dependent t-test for the training group. And what you see is the training group demonstrated a bigger difference from pre to post. Uh, so they're up at like three and a half versus only like two for the, uh, for the control group. And that's reflected in the t-value, of course, and in the p-value, of course. Now degrees of freedom 79 because there were 80 subjects in the training conditions altogether. Because there are four different training conditions and I put 20 in each of them. So there are 80 altogether. So that's significant, and it looks bigger, it looks like a bigger training effect, right, than the control group. But we would have to do an independent t-test to compare that to the gain for the control group, and that's what we'll do next. Um, oh, I forgot. <laughs> here's the Cohen's D. Uh, we're not done yet. So here's the output for the Cohen's D. Um, and again, these are, these are a little larger than what Yaki et al. observed. I think I didn't throw in enough uh, within groups variance in my simulation. Um, but it, it comes close enough, right? Um, so the, the Cohen's D for the control group is 1.4. Again, it's pretty big. But the more important point is that the Cohen's D for the training group is larger. So it looks like there's a training effect going on. But again, let's compare control versus training. So that's what we do in the independent t-test. Because in the independent t-test, if you are assigned to control, then you're not doing training. If you're assigned to training, you're not doing control. Two independent samples. So the way to do that, the, the syntax is a little different. It's still the t.test function. Uh, then it's open paren, dependent variable, tilde, independent variable. So our dependent variable is the gain score. Our independent variable is training. Did they do training or did they not do training? I set this last part, var.equal equals true, 
um, because I did check it out. I, I did a Levine's test, which we'll cover in the ANOVA segment. Uh, and the, va the variances are equivalent. Uh, we want to know that because that could influence the outcome. I don't want to sort of get us bogged down in that here in t-tests. We'll cover that in more detail in the next segment when we do in ANOVA. And then here's the syntax for, or sorry, the code for Cohen's D. Remember, you have to get the standard error of the difference. Um, and that requires doing pooled variance or pooled standard deviation. Um, so what I did in this first line of code was I got a pooled standard deviation. Again, I'm accessing uh, the describe output table to get the standard deviation for the training group. And I have to weight that a little more because there are more people in the training group. So that's the degrees of freedom for the training group over the total degrees of freedom for this t-test. And here, that's the degrees of freedom for the control group over the total degrees of freedom for this t-test. I just want to weight this pooled standard deviation. Then my Cohen's D comparing control and training, that's what my uh, coding means there. So D.CT is this Cohen's D comparing control and training. It's just the mean for the training condition. That's wm.t.out43. The mean for the control condition divided by the pooled standard deviation. Here's what it looks like, the output. So it says two sample t-tests. That's mean independent t-tests. And the t-value is about four, so that's going to be significant. Sure, it's pretty low t-value. And again, degrees of freedom is 118, because there were 40 subjects in the control condition and 80 in the training condition. So it's 40 minus 1 plus 80 minus 1, so 118. Um, if we look down here, we see uh, Cohen's D of about 0.79 or say 0.8. So again, I think that's a little larger than what Yaki et al. reported, uh, but not too much larger. So this replicates, uh, <laughs> replicates. I made up the data, <laughs> um, but it simulates. Uh, the Yaki et al. results. Again, what does all this mean together? It means that the difference in the gain scores between training and control is significant. And it's a pretty large effect size. Cohen's D of 0.8 is pretty respectable. Uh, so that's evidence that this training regimen works. Again, to recap, here are those results. What we did, when we did the dependent test, we did the dependent test on the control group. What we were looking at is the, the unfilled dots, so the control group. We were comparing this point to that point. That's what we did when we did the dependent t-test on control. Then we did the dependent t-test on training, so we compared that point to that point. Those were both significant, but it looked like the effect size was larger in the training group. So what we did next was we looked at the gain, so we looked at the difference for training versus control, essentially this piece, and lo and behold, that too is significant. Again, suggesting that working memory training does enhance intelligence. But as we know, there are several complications, uh, limitations with this particular experiment. Uh, so as I said, the jury's still out. But that illustrates how to do t-tests uh, using this working memory training example.